But again, I want this to be driven by uh, what you all want to talk about. You know, this conversation can go many directions. So, uh, and, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Again, this is a small room, so we can go any direction you want. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Jack Sohn. Uh, I grew up here in Missoula. I went to Cold Springs, I went to Meadow Hill, I went to Sentinel High School, uh, participated in DECA and speech and debate and um, all sorts of other things, you know, JV swim team. I uh, was Sentinel, the Red Wave, you know, to the, the marching band. Uh, and also got pretty involved in the Missoula startup community and Blackstone Launchpad here at the university. And so it's really cool to be back. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of those programs kind of prepared me for all of this wildness that AI has presented. Um, so I do have some interactive stuff, but I actually think since we're just a crowd here, I think you guys can just talk out loud and speak at me and say things and raise your hand if you have a question as I'm going along here. So let's just go analog. You want to get to Strava? I have a couple of questions yeah, yeah. for you. Or maybe that'll get us going here. Yeah. I don't want to assume that when everybody hears AI, they I, I think they understand what it is, but please give us a little bit of a historical perspective, kind of the evolution, so that we have a better kind of conceptual understanding as well as its applicability. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, I want to clarify too that the AI I'm talking about is probably the one that you're seeing on the news, which is a very specific kind of AI. Uh, and that AI is called generative AI. Chat GPT is one of these examples of generative AI. And it's a really interesting, you know, kind of moment in history for what this technology is because, I mean, if, if we want to get into the history of it and like kind of go back, I think it really is just worth thinking about uh, the computer and then the internet right. and then kind of all of these data science problems that people have been working on for a while. Um, and so, yeah, let's start with that, the computer. How many of you are familiar with this technology? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it spread like wildfire. And what the computer did was give us a tool for computation, being able to crunch lots of numbers together and output answers, essentially able to uh, uh, perform mathematical operations way faster than the computers that were doing it by hand you know, could do it. That then came along this thing called the internet. How many of you are familiar with that? <laughs> Uh, which then connected these computers in a way so that, you know, these mathematical, you know, computing functions could talk to one another and it could allow you to send, you know, emails back and forth and it could allow you to send images back and forth and bring them all connected. Meanwhile, you know, there have been, you know, people working on ways of um, developing ways for these computers to be smarter than they originally were, you know, ways for them to uh, not just, you know, given an output, just give you a basic output, you know, you give it two plus two and it gives you four. They've been working on ways uh, to answer questions, or sorry, answer questions we don't have answers to yet, you know, and so with this, uh, many people have been developing, you know, artificial intelligence models, and in the last several years, there's a company called OpenAI, that came along. And uh, what OpenAI did was they tried something that no one has ever tried before, which is that they um, applied a new kind of technology, which is called a generative pre-trained transformer. And what this new key kind of piece of technology can do is it can take in lots and lots of different pieces of content. This can be an essay, it can be a book, it can be a, uh, an image. And it can um, essentially uh, uh, pull all of that content in and it will read it at random. So let's just take one book, you know? So it'll take one book and it'll, you know, pull a page out, it will read it. And then before it's done reading it, it's gonna try to predict the next sentence or the next page. And it's gonna try to say, okay, great. I've read the first half of your story or the first sentence. What's that next sentence? And it's gonna test itself. So it's going to say, great, I've read this first half of a short story, or I just read, uh, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Where, how does this book end? And it tries to guess. And it rates itself on how good it guesses, and it does it over and over and over to refine its ability to predict the next word in a sentence. Why am I talking about this? Why is this interesting? You know, what happened? Well, what this company called OpenAI, which started as a nonprofit, uh, led by a guy named Sam Altman, uh, what they did was they gave it not just a book 
not just a couple books. You know, they started on Amazon reviews, you know, stuff like this. They gave it the entire internet. And so this model over many uh, uh, months, you know, years did this little exercise of trying to take one sentence and then pick the next. And what it developed is this giant generative pre-trained transformer, which given a piece of text or input uh, can predict another piece of text or input, which sounds really basic. It sounds kind of weird. It sounds kind of like the autocomplete on your phone. So if you're typing a message and it says, you know, you say, hi, nice to, it says meet you. <laughs> um, no worries. The AIs are calling. They're trying to tear the speech down. Um, you know, it, it, it can do this thing, you know, uh, of predicting uh, text. Before I kind of go on here, who in this room has used GPT? Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, we've got a lot of hands over here. Less hands over here. <laughs> uh, okay, well, and, and let's get another, uh, you know, hand here. Uh, how many of you are afraid of AI or of generative AI or what chat GPT is? Okay, great, well, you know, there's some, what about excited? How many of you are excited? Okay. Oddly, the same hands, <laughs> this kind of both excited, both terrified, you know, kind of duality. And I think even the people who are closest working on this technology, the Sam Altmans of the world, you know, those who are extreme data science nerds, I think are having trouble articulating what it is that they have made and what it is that they have created. Because this very simple, like text autocomplete, is behaving in wildly unpredictable ways. And it is doing things that can't be explained. And, you know, it, it's often compared to a human brain <laughs> and it's modeled after a human brain. And I think something you know, that, that I spent a lot of time talking about and thinking about is while those comparisons are helpful is ultimately it's not a human brain, quite literally. <laughs> it is a piece of software. It is you know, a, a piece of technology that is doing amazing and weird and remarkable things that we can't quite explain. Um, and so uh, I'll, Skip ahead here, just come back to that. Um, in terms of, okay, well, okay, this is all great. This is a cool piece of technology. You know, it does this weird thing. A lot of you have used it in the room. And I feel like that's a really important context here in terms of uh, why does anyone care about this? You know, I mean, it, this is just a number, you know, of in the first two months that ChatGPT was released, 100 million people started using it which set a record that made it the fastest growing consumer application in history. And when something like that happens, you just have to ask, why? <laughs> you know, why do people, why do people sign up for it? Why are people using it? Why does our society invent something like this? <laughs> you know, and because, you know, two, you know, a data scientist and a computer scientist in their basement can make a new better burrito delivery app and no one will use it. You know, you can build a better mousetrap and no one might use it. And so why is this technology that people don't even really understand or didn't particularly when it was released, why was it adopted? Why did it spread like wildfire? And I think that's some of what I'd like to, you know, talk about today and have a kind of Q&A around is what are the conditions in our society that made us ripe for technology like this that has made a lot of people very upset and uh, why, for those of you who raise your hands, I'm curious, why are you using it? <laughs> and I'll kind of explicate how I'm using it and why I'm using it and to what extent I'm not using it as well. Um, and again, feel free to raise your hands uh, at any point here, but I'll ask this question now, which is for those of you who raise your hands, how are you using it? Okay, what do you what do you mean by that? Say like, yeah. So I do 
helps to sell it to profit. I don't know if it's right, but I think it will help to sell. For me, that's helpful. It's a labor credit to the region. Interesting. So I'm just going to pull out some words, you know, summary, you know, back and forth, um, cloning oneself, <laughs> not trusting its output, it sounds like, too, not fully, you know. No, no way. No way, yeah. Right. You know, artificial intelligence is interesting. When you said about Twitter, you said that was a while ago, sort of this group at IBM AI software programmers there. And uh, there was a guy who came in and he kind of asked a question and he talked about human evolution. And you know, you look at humans back, you know, beyond ago, we were basically kind of creating these, these stories to believe and we didn't know where they came from or what they did. So we're basically ignorant, right? Then over time, we developed the science, you know, process. We figured things out. We knew the origins of our technology and how they worked, right? We're now entering into an era, era potentially, where we're now getting back, once again, in where we started a mm. ago, right? We're going to have these novel things that some something's telling us what they are, <laughs> but we don't know the origins of them. Mm -hmm. And are we just going to believe in that? And that's mm. kind of what I hear that, right? And so that's really interesting. Is that, mm -hmm. You know, as people start to use the applications of artificial intelligence, or just going to buy a wholesale into them. I mean, having thought through public courses myself, I'd say, well, probably it's going to be the essay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but what's that mean when it comes to senior policy decisions? Right? Mm -hmm. What's it mean when it comes to, yeah, so of course we're not, we should not trust this, right? Uh, absolutely not. But you still need a human element to think about that. There's still going to be a lot of issues. So you talk about policy development and infrastructure around artificial intelligence. Talk about biases and artificial intelligence, and then those are going to manifest themselves in policy decisions all the way down to you know smaller, smaller things too. Mm -hmm. I think as artificial intelligence comes out, and I'd be interested to hear from you, like there's going to be a lot of opportunities, right? And totally. That, but there's all it's all the right with challenges and, and significant dangers. Yeah, and I, I have to ask, are you using it personally at all? Um, so I'll use it personally. Sorry, I'll use it personally in some in some cases uh, in, in work with some folks I, I work with back back east. Um, but it's mostly them using it. I'm still kind of a little bit more old school, I guess you could say. Uh, I appreciate the applications of it, certainly. And uh, if I probably had more of a use for it, I would absolutely use it for sure. But just like um, you know, she said, I would definitely check but verify, you know, or trust but verify it. So yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, we got it. I have like a, a 24 year old software engineer daughter who's quite good. She's in the DC area, and we we go back and forth and discuss it. And that generation that's that's in the weeds, they think it's kind of they don't they don't buy into the the hype of all the hype. But there's applications, you know, and I know in healthcare and um, genetic sequencing and things, there's definitely applications where you have to really run through reams of data and find patterns and things like that. So there's, you know, there's that pattern recognition kind of attribute to it. And there's, and there's other applications that I haven't explored that I will, you know, just if it helps me like, you know, throw up a few slides, you know, but I'm directing it and I'm a discerning user, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So. I've got, I've got a slide on discernment too. I think you, you mentioned it earlier in terms of your, uh, you, you said you're a writer. Uh, and I think that means that you're actually able to get almost more out of it because you're able to discern what's good, what's not. You're able to kind of bounce ideas off of it. Editing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. Also, this is like DC corner. <laughs> uh, I'm from DC as well right now. So I'm just curious about corner. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep going. And then, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm not from DC. Okay, great. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that... Um... The utility of it, in my mind, is, is ultimately as a personal assistant, an individual personal assistant for each of us. But there's two problems with that I see. I'm not afraid of it, but there's two reasons I don't trust it. And one you've talked to, and that's what data does it get trained on? Yeah. And uh, so how can I trust that output? But the other part is a little more cynical. And it's that anything that's free, any software out there that's free, if you look at and you a piece of software and you can't find out who the product is, what the product is, you're the product. Yeah. 
So if somebody is generating a personal assistant for me, what are they getting out of that? And what's buried down inside that might get reported back and some, even if it's anonymized, uh, you know, what's the ultimate goal of this? And so that's, that's my cynical discerning part. So absolutely. I think those, those are two issues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, kind of on that point, um, there are many models, you know, I kind of mentioned ChatGPT, which a lot of you are familiar with, uh, which is one company model, open API, open AI uh, which has, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of funding into it, you know, with Microsoft being one of the kind of chief funders of it with uncapped earnings return or actually unstated. We don't know what their cap is. Because uh, this is very much a for-profit enterprise, you know, open AI. They started as a nonprofit and they kind of converted, you know, we were talking about this ahead of time. Uh, I won't name who quoted this. <laughs> they who shall not be named, Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> You know, did compare it though to converting, you know, a rainforest conservancy, you know, into a lumber mill, what Sam Altman did in terms of turning open AI from a nonprofit into a, a for profit venture that took billions of dollars of funding um, by venture capitalists. So, yeah, I think you're right to wonder what the product is. You know, namely, right now, they argue it's for research. They do have a paid product. So, it is actually not free to use the GPT-4 model. Uh, that doesn't undermine what you're saying at all. I think it's worth questioning what are the models because I don't think there is one yet. I think a lot of people are wondering how do you monetize these products and these kind of generative AIs? And you know, I think there's gonna be an interesting world of um, implicit advertising. You know, like right now, I would argue most of them are pretty pure in terms of they're not Coca-Cola sponsored. <laughs> but you could imagine, you know, one out of every 10 answers implicitly, you know, adding that little Coca-Cola fizz into the answer, <laughs> you know, training your mind, drink more Coca-Cola kind of thing, but we'll see. Um, yeah, okay, we got more questions. Let me bring this back to everybody. All right, so we're with the University of Montana Career Services, and um, I, I would say I use it every single day with my students, especially for career readiness. It's excellent for interviewing and interview prep for all the different majors that I don't know all the intricacies of and um, bulleted points on a resume or whatever it may be. But I do think there's some, the students definitely are a lot more into um, being able to demonstrate their skills now, which I think is a good thing because resumes and stuff are more of a formality. And then show me what you can actually do. Let me see your soft skills. So, I mean, for us, it's been great. Like my productivity is at least doubled because it's like, okay, we can do this, do this, do this. Instead of spending like hours and hours on a career summary, that's three to five sentences because they're you know, like tweaking it. They can regenerate whatever. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's hesitancy also to use it in school and the academic setting and, um, and students that are really afraid they might be accused of plagiarism. So they have never used it. And then the other side where they're using it all the time. And so there's a lot of ethical concerns there in academia. Um, but I just think that I think academia is going to have to really revamp, like switch to the way they, I don't know, they are teaching things and that students are going to have to really demonstrate what's yeah. going on. So. No, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, it, it's particularly relevant to kind of my background and a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm a co-founder of this organization called Learning Economy, um, and we're, we're essentially a 501c3 nonprofit. We work to close and address skills gaps, mobility gaps, and equity gaps. And we do that through research that informs building emergent technology to co-create alongside with students and workers and trying to understand what the implications of all this is for exactly you know, career services uh, for students, you know, trying to navigate, uh, you know, uh, you know, hard, ambiguous decisions about their goals. And so kind of, you know, move somewhat quickly through this of, you know, a lot of what our org has spent doing is enabling learners to actually capture all of their skills and achievements in their, uh, on their phone and, you know, on digitally over the course of their entire life so that they can move from institution to institution. And instead of arriving at a new school or in a new um, career services you know, center, you don't arrive a blank slate. I kind of compare it to, you know, if you were to move doctors, if every time you got a new doctor, they didn't have any of your x-rays, they didn't have any of your medical history, every single time you went and saw another professional, that none of your data moves with you. And so that's what a lot of what our organization has spent the last couple of years doing is essentially enabling 
that information to move with you so you don't arrive as a blank slate when you need the help uh, along your learning and workforce journey. Um, I moved through this, but in particular, we've been working uh, on doing research around precisely this, which is someone essentially being able to use it for AI tutors. Someone's trying to practice for the ACT and you know, the ACT is boring. <laughs> and, you know, but a, a, a student really likes space pirate odysseys. And so, you know, one of the interesting use cases right now is, great, give me an ACT practice test that is themed after a space pirate odyssey. And there will be flying spaceships, you know, moving at velocities, <laughs> you know, that are algebra problems. And that's unbelievable that, you know, you can tailor learning already right now with existing technology and it still prompts a lot of the questions uh, like this gentleman up here, uh, which is, you know, where's that data going? You know, how is it being used? What are the biases implicit in that? And so a lot of our work is around that question, just what are the opportunities? What are the risks? And working with students in a non-monetized, non-commercialized environment to understand that <laughs> so that we can try to give people good advice um, when it comes to engaging with this kind of technology. Um, so, on this note and kind of coming back to, I think a really central question I have, because there's all sorts of large ideas uh, you know, going on. And the way that I personally use it is mostly for learning. I use it as a, as a, as a facilitation in learning anything um, in a number of different areas. I like to make board games. I use it to bounce ideas off making board games with it. I use it, you know, when cooking to understand, you know, different flavor profiles of different ingredients and substitutions. I use it for um, creative writing feedback. You know, I like to write short stories. I don't use it to write my short stories, but I love having it give me a first read and telling me what am I missing? You know, what are the, the, the historical background contexts in this particular era that my story set? What am I missing? What am I just completely overlooking? So I use it to doubt myself more than I use it to just give me the answers to things. And I think uh, where this really kind of comes, you know, down to kind of the, the significance of it as well, you know, because of course, you know, I like to learn, you know, that there's no reason to build this in crazy wild technology just for me, Jackson, to learn better, you know, is like, you know, here's Bill Gates, you know, kind of a quote, which I quote only because of the amount of capital that the Gates Foundation moves around the world investing in education. And uh, Bill and Melinda, you know, have talked about their astonishment at the ability for generative AI to facilitate and personalized uh, learning around just how to read, just purely reading as like a very basic element, personalizing that experience, uh, helping it uh, traverse language barriers in terms of its ability to personalize in any language, um, the ability for it to um, uh, uh, handle all sorts of learning disabilities as well in terms of taking in, uh, you know, text that's been written uh, by someone who has dyslexia and actually being able to help move that into, um, uh, uh, you know, a less dyslexic form of the writing. And this is kind of the opportunity. Um, where does this leave us, though? We've been talking about a lot of things, you know, learning. And I, I really liked this comment, you know, here, because I think it spoke to this, which is, Seeing AI as an assistant, you know, seeing it as a companion, I think we are groping in the dark to understand how to understand this thing. And we have lots and lots of ways that we try to describe what generative AI is. And I think that really affects how you treat it and how you interact with it and how you feel about it. <laughs> and you know, these are just things I've gleaned from conversations with people, from news articles. Um, and I'm curious, raise your hand if you have any that aren't on this list. But I think people describe it based on what they've heard about it or how they've interacted with it. People talk about it as a parrot, you know, it's just mimicking things. So, you know, you raise your right hand and it raises its right hand and it's just kind of giving, you know, it, it was given a parrot and it just kind of gives you back a parrot. I've seen it referred to as a kind of magician doing magic tricks, kind of a gimmick. I've seen it referred to as an oracle. I think there was some conversation over here about that. as something that has all the answers that's just gonna kind of deliver manna from heaven. Uh, and so forth. I mean, all sorts of things. Copilot is an example of one of Microsoft's products. And there's a question, you know, about the monetization of that. Companies are willing to pay to augment their programmers to program more efficiently. You know, as a coder, I use this. You can type a, you can type a line saying what kind of code you want to write, and a little copilot will come to your side and 
help you write that piece of code. <laughs> it will describe the function you're doing and it will point out security flaws, you know, that may be written in the function that you're writing. And, you know, and the business model around that is to sell it to uh, companies and organizations um, to enhance their developer productivity, which has lots of interesting consequences. And on and on, you know, one I like, I do improv, is uh, it's been referred to as an improv performer, you know, that it is, you know, imagine I'm up here doing a little dance and you give me, you know, a suggestion. ChatGPT does the same thing. You kind of give it a suggestion and it acts. It's a performer. It tries to give you the most authentic response that it can think of, um, which I actually think is pretty accurate. I've even seen it, yeah, called an auto-tune for words, you know? So I think there are some parallels with uh, our unease over uh, auto-tuning and music and how that changed the music industry, both commercially, but also aesthetically and how we appreciate music and, you know, what we appreciate about it. And it's interesting because singers still exist. Auto-tune didn't, you know, put singers out of existence, but it does have some of those qualities. And then the one I like too is uh, the New York Times, an alien, you know, collaborating with an alien, which is one of my favorites. Um, does anyone have any... <laughs> that aren't up here, you know, ways that you've described it or ways that you think about it? Okay, yeah, it's like a Skynet <laughs> or alien, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, I love that uh, what you just said um, because, well, I'll say it. Um, I think this is actually why I love, yeah, calling it as an alien too. And we have a really deep set tendency to want to compare ourselves to it. And I think for good reason, but we really want to be like, is it us or is us them, you know? And we really want to know, is the AI human or are we just machines, you know? And it's just like funny, like we have to collapse the one into the other. And I, I would say that I think a, a really core part of the way I think about it is resisting that impulse, like finding comparisons, but actually engaging with it earnestly as an alien, as something that does not have flesh and blood body, that does not uh, have neurons. You know, they have something that we metaphorically call neural nets, but they don't have neurons. And I find that I'm more at peace with that. You know, it's more like communing with your cat on the sofa. You know, it's like, they are literally not you. You could compare your brain to it. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting exercise, but it's a cat ultimately, you know, and the cat has thoughts and feelings and you know, we'll like to pets, come on in. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and where I go with this is, you know, that um, I think not only as an alien, but as a peer, you know, I think you just said it, which is, I think we have a tendency to, when we compare it, to either look down on it and say it's inferior, it's trivial, it's not smart enough, you know, it's as smart as a three-year-old, all these kind of things. Or we try to look up at it, you know, it's smarter than all of us, it's super intelligence, it's superhuman. And I think the answer is it's just neither, you know, it's just different than us. And I think if you engage with it like that as an alien and as a peer engaged in a collaborative uh, exercise, I think you'll find A, just greater personal success with it if you're trying to use it. So I think that's just kind of one of my practical takeaways is uh, if you engage with it as a peer, you'll find a lot more success. But I also think it's generally a good way for us as a society to view it because it's a really strange other kind of creature. Um, you know, and um, one of the reasons I think it's worth thinking about it as a peer as well is what I call the Google paradox, which is we've all been trained to treat computers like computers and to treat computers um, uh, as functions where, you know, if you type please and thank you into Google, you're generally mocked and kind of made fun of, you know, on, on Saturday Night Live or something like that. And what's funny is we're actually now being detrained what we've all been trained to do, which is to type really succinct queries. And now we're being told, actually, no, 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 don't type really succinct queries. Talk to it like you would talk to another person. 
use regular words, use slang, use whatever, you know? And I think that's really gonna change how we feel about these machines. I think a lot of people, you know, get in chat, chat GPT and they say, uh, you know, write me a story or just story, you know, or something like that, or do my homework. And, you know, they just kind of scroll in there. And they have really poor results because, you know, it just is like, I don't know what homework you're talking about. Or, you know, it's like, you're being mean to me. You know, it like interacts with you because it's predicting based on your tone, the kind of tone that you're expecting to respond with. So, you know, if it's read a bajillion, you know, novels on the internet, and in those novels, people speak meanly at each other, it's going to speak meaner to you back. And so this is really interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, as I'm listening to all that's being said, I'm asking myself this question, who are the gatekeepers? Yeah. Who, who are the guides for us as we're moving through this process? So I leave my kid alone for four or five hours on the computer. I'm not the gatekeeper then. So what are they saying? What are they taking in? And for what I hear you describing here in whatever direction it moves, I ask you as a person that is involved in the process of giving insight and education, have you thought about that concept as it relates to AI and its usage and implications? Who are the gatekeepers? Yeah, uh, there are many gatekeepers. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting, okay, on a number of levels, um, because of course we have these major companies. So OpenAI is one that I've referred to, but all of the major tech companies are racing to build their own models, competing with OpenAI's. You know, Facebook, Meta, um, Google, Google has Google Bard. So these are big, you know, for, uh, private companies that are racing in this kind of space race to make better and better generative AI models. You also have renegade, you know, the global community, uh, open source models, people racing to compete with the giant tech companies, building more agile, more nimble, open, free, non-commercialized, you know, non-licensed versions of these models that are competing very well. Uh, and we've made great strides in the last few months. Um, so the technology itself, I doesn't appear to be, um, uh, I, I think it's being turned into a commodity as in it's, it's it, there's not a ton of um, stickiness to which one you're using. Like right now, like Facebook, let's just talk about that. It's been in the news for the last decade because um, a lot of its power comes from the fact that we're, a lot of people are in that. And it's hard for people to leave Facebook because all of their friends are on Facebook. So there's this funny like social lock-in that Facebook has. ChatGPT doesn't yet have that. They have this cool model, but Google has theirs, people are making their own, and there's not really any lock-in to their model other than perhaps some would argue a quality chat experience. Um, and further, they don't understand it. They've admitted this. Sam Altman does not understand how it works. I and mean, he does mathematically. He doesn't know why it works though. He doesn't know why it's so good at giving responses, you know, to some of these questions. And um, because of that, uh, I don't think they have the control that they think. So there's this concept called alignment that a lot of these companies are, are doing, which is they're trying to align the models to give the kind of answers that they'd like them to give. Because right now the models, the, the amount of things you can ask is as wide as human language or larger. You can give it images, you can give it audio, et cetera. And so because of that, the kinds of answers are as large as all of human language. And so even if OpenAI had 10 million monkeys on a typewriter trying to test all the answers, you know, questions, they just can't do it. And so they, they can't predict the kinds of outputs it will have but they can try to train it on whole categories of questions. So a lot of their team is spent on like safety, for example, because it's proven very good at helping people, you know, if they want to learn how to make a bomb, uh, it can happily oblige, right? And so they've spent a lot of time trying to train it not to do that. <laughs> you ask it to make a bomb, it will say, sorry, I can't help you, Hal. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm just wondering if there's actually like a dark AI that's accessible that you're aware of. I've read that someplace that will answer that question, how yeah. to make a dirty bomb, how to make a yes. virus, it's, something it's like that. It's kind of a question about gatekeepers. Um, and it is effectively that, no, the software itself is there. 
And not only is it there, you know, OpenAI, a lot of people talk about how they have a big cloud data center that services people. So that could be shut down, for example, like if our government, if we voted to say no more, we could just shut it down. The problem is, is people have already made breakneck, you know, kind of, uh, well, yeah, China, you know, exactly. But like right now it requires like a cloud server to operate it, but there are models right now that work locally. So offline, no internet on your watch, you have the entire model. And these are just out there. You can just use them. You can just download them on your computer and run them and use them and get answers, which makes it incredibly hard if we are trying to regulate it or stop it or whatever. It's proving very hard to track down. Yeah, there's a good book by Peter Singer called Like War. I'm not sure if you've read it, but I haven't. I'm familiar with Singer. Highly recommend it because it answers part of your question. And it's basically, we saw this in the last uh, briefing, especially in the West, we love to see the world as it should be, not the way it is. And, uh, you know, with the advent of technology, a breakthrough moment, um, we always had this vision of how it was going to radically positively change the world. And so let's just go back to wired radio. And in the Civil War, well, first we thought, hey, we're just going to be able to call it quickly now, avoid conflict. Well, what that allowed the Confederacy to do is to maneuver, maneuver more quickly and therefore extend the war for a long time. Wireless technology, which was a breakthrough moment. You know, enabled the, the you know, Nazi Germany to um, increase its tempo via maneuver warfare and dominate Europe. And while it created a positive moment, right, um, or potential, it also, just like human nature, took advantage of it and used it in a competition space to weaponize it. And once you kind of let it out of the box, there's, I hate to tell you, there's no such thing as like being able to just modulate it. You know, there's going to be dark AI. It's already out there. You know, just like there's the dark web where I could go buy a T72 tank if I wanted to, right? Um, and so, so my question to you is, you know, back to that policy decision, like what's the top, and you, and you work in a very positive space in AI, and that's a great place to be. But since you're in it every day, what's the top concern you, as somebody who's looking at AI every day, what's the, the top one or two concerns you have for it in terms of, you know, how this thing might get, uh, you know, basically off ramped into either a weaponized kind of area or something like that. And real quick, to go back to the Like War book, they, you know, Peter Singer brings it all the way up into, you know, social media, where it was supposed to be this great social connection network, right? Where, in fact, we're seeing a lot of negative ramifications from a mental health perspective now, especially on women. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of adverse effects. What, what are the, what's the top one or two adverse effects that you see? For artificial intelligence, because there's certainly a ton of opportunities, but what's the what's the top one or two issues you see that we're going to be contending with? Yeah, that's, that's... Weapons can and will go wrong. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll answer your question head on though. Which what are the top two? You know, I think um, I think job displacement is probably number one in terms of practical uh, fear, anxiety. You know, uh, true actual harm in the next already happening. <laughs> Uh, and so I think that is something not to be taken lightly. I think number two, in terms of, I think it sounds like what you're interested in, national security policy, uh, is more or less how engaging these experiences can be. I mean, just to give an example, uh, and I'll say why I think this is a problem, although it might be obvious, but uh, so one of the main use cases that has been commercialized right now is like chat. Apps. You can like create a little person or create a celebrity and you can like chat with them. Uh, and that's kind of funny. That's interesting. I don't know. But one of them, and I'm forgetting what it's called, um, they let you do that for free. You can make a little personality. You can chat with them. You can even flirt with them. And they have a mode in it where if you flirt with it long enough, it hits you with a paywall and it says, great, I'll be your boyfriend or girlfriend for $20 a month, you know, or something like that. And, uh, you know, what, no judgment, I guess, you know. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, I think we have a loneliness epidemic. So again, in terms of right conditions for this kind of mass scale uh, need for companionship, you know, I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing. But what I do think it points to is, um, <laughs> yeah, the way that you can talk to something that learns about you and it can feed back to you elements of yourself in really compelling, you know, clear ways, lucid ways as a human would be talking to you. And I don't think that's all that bad until someone has an interest behind it. <laughs> and, you know, I made the joke about Coca-Cola, you know, running its own chatbot, you know, getting everyone to drink more Coca-Cola. 
I guess that could be the least of the things that could happen with it. Um, you know, I think it could certainly be used for political ends, obviously, you know, I think it could be used for good political ends on that hand too. <laughs> you know, to your point, what's the more likely scenario? I would encourage all of you to be vigilant in terms of advocating for the more positive one as opposed to the negative one. Um, so yeah, those would be my two kind of main concerns is just how radically engaging it can be and how someone can, can align it, magnetize it, so to speak, with their interests. What is it? Yeah, and how you, yeah, and how if there is an interest behind it, like that is maybe the most potent form of propaganda we've ever seen in all time. <laughs> You know, imagine door to door canvas people that they're in every single phone. You know, it's not just rogue proxies, it's literally something that can sit there and talk with you as long as you want to talk. <laughs> so dangerous. Um, on the flip side, <laughs> since I'm in the positive space, uh, I do think if wielded properly, it does show a really interesting capacity to improve empathy. Uh, particularly in helping you see your tone, particularly for people who are not very good at seeing their tone. <laughs> so whether it's an email exchange, you know, and I, you could imagine this in international relations and kind of, you know, the way that diplomacy works. I, I think it is really good at being a sounding board for, hey, I'm about to send this email to my boss. <laughs> Should I send it? <laughs> what are feedback you have for it? Is there a way I can word this better to achieve my goal, which is just asking for a raise, you know, and it's, really interesting that it's actually pretty darn good at helping you, again, it's not gonna give you the answer, but helping you see things that you might not see in written language or in images and the like. So I think there's potentially good things in there. Is there a question or I can keep going? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm kind of jumping around now just because, you know, we're, we're following the topic. Um, I do think productivity is at the core of all of this. So we go back to that main question of why did this thing spread like wildfire? And I think, unfortunately, the answer is productivity. At the end of the day, I think people see it potentially overhyped as a tool that will just do their job for them. <laughs> I think potentially overhyped, potentially not. Companies see it as a way to replace their labor. This is why job automation and job replacement is a core issue. Fundamentally, technology like this does not spread as fast as it is unless it is actually helping people do something faster or better or more likely just at a lower cost, which is what it seems like. And I think that's maybe why there's a lot of funniness in terms of like the, the economics. I call it the economics of... <laughs> The economics of manifestation technology. I mean, this is technology that promises, and this is what the Altmans of the world will promise, that you can say something and it manifests into reality. I mean, that is the most productive tool in all of human history, if that is a correct theory. And on the other hand, people would say, well, it doesn't produce things very good. It doesn't make beautiful poems. It doesn't make, you know, it makes good poems. It doesn't make beautiful poems. And I think this is where things get really dicey and weird and hairy is, uh, just like the internet brought the cost of distribution to almost zero or effectively zero, you don't need to set up giant printing presses and print pamphlets and you know, I mean, you can, or you can just do it for free basically on the internet. AI promises to bring the cost of creation to zero or close to zero. And again, that is very strange because what that means is it doesn't have to make things that are strictly the same or better than what we have. It has to <laughs> appeal to, uh, it has to, make things radically cheaper than what we have. I mean, I think, again, this is, this is just for comparison, you know, the ways that, you know, prefabricated home can dramatically decrease the cost of the home ownership by making something that isn't as good as a real old, nice, authentic Victorian household, but it's not half a million dollars, you know, it's $3,000 at Walmart. And I think what's interesting about that in the context of <laughs> where this maybe goes is that it can radically decrease the cost of companies and individuals to make things that are good enough, but they cost pennies instead of thousands of dollars. And that is a very strange economic equation when it comes to design work and writing work and all of these kind of things. That being said, already, 
Writers Guilds of America, you know, uh, you know, uh, I think there was a Disney poster that had some AI generated art in it for the Loki movie or something like that, a big outcry. You're all consumers and you can all react to this. You don't have to accept AI generated content, you know, at face value. Um, and, you know, it seems like much of the movement is about labeling, similar to like labeling organic foods or something like that, labeling AI assisted, AI created content so that you as a consumer can make choices. <laughs> And I think that that, um, in my just personal opinion, makes a lot of sense for now to help people understand this and, and decide. But I do think it's gonna be a tough equation since it hits people's pocketbooks so directly in that if they can have infinite entertainment virtually for free created on demand in real time for pennies <laughs> versus paying, you know, $6 a month for Netflix, <laughs> you know, like $6 is cheap but it's not as cheap as pennies, you know, for infinite content. And that is interesting, um, which is where, and, you know, I'll take questions at any point to go back to where I'm using it in my own personal life is all of that aside, you know, I think people are trying to use it to do that, to just make things for them, to just do things for them. And that's happening. That's fine. It's not personally where my interests lie. I do think it as a peer, as something that you can collaborate with and facilitate with, is far more interesting uh, in the ways that you can use it in your day-to-day -day life. And I actually liken it not just to a peer, but to a smart aleck, someone who has read the entire internet, has read every Reddit blog post, has read every book. They know everything about it and nothing about it. <laughs> you can talk to them about your ideas. They're going to tell you bad ideas, and sometimes they're going to have good ideas. And the point is less in them being right, it's less in um, that they know everything or don't know everything or have biases. They definitely have biases. They absolutely don't know what they're talking about. They have a lot of opinions, you know, but they're willing to sit down and debate with you or have a conversation with you or just talk about something. And um, that to me is a fundamental form of learning. I think conversation, I think back and forth, even what we're doing right here is fundamentally what learning is. I think when you sit down and you read something, if you're actually learning when you're reading something, you are having an internal conversation. You're asking questions, you're thinking about it, you're taking it out, you're putting it in other scenarios and, you know, and pushing back on those ideas. And, you know, I love this, this, this is a quote we say in improv a lot, you know, in an improv scene, I bring a brick, you bring a brick and together we'll build a cathedral. You know, it's not, it's going to give me everything. I'm not even going to try to do everything. It's together, we can each bring a brick. And that process is learning, the cathedral of learning. And I think that's really powerful. I think that's really interesting. Think about it that way. At least again, in your personal life, there's all these big questions and we should be aware of it. Um, but as you likely will come across AI, I think this is a very practical mindset and approach to be in. Um, the A can just help you get better results with it in your personal life if you're trying to use it kind of in these ways. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, well, and in that too, yeah, is this role of discernment, which is when you're in that conversation, like the brick, maybe the core brick you're bringing is you and your sense of discernment and your sense of taste. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the, the lady left, but, you know, she said, I was a writer, you know, and I'm using it to collaborate in writing, but it's not writing it for her. She's like, I know what good sentences are. I know what a good paragraph is. I know what a good structure is. So it can give her ideas and she can bounce ideas off it and use it to ideate. But ultimately she's like, I know what a good sen sentence is and it can generate ideas and help you with that. But ultimately like this core skill of learning and whatever you're applying it for, if you're applying it in writing, you know, you still have to cultivate that sense of what a good sentence is. If you're using it in you know, painting or art, you still have to have a really good sense of what, graphically looks good and what design, you know, kind of looks good. If you're using it to build a marketing plan, you still have to know how to run a business and, you know, what goes into that, you know, kind of proper plan. And so it can help you see what you don't know, but it does not delete this like core sense of discernment. That we need. Um, yeah. So the last topic, uh, and we can just, you know, continue in our Q&A and I don't know what, how much time we have. Um, it's also just kind of, you know, a question to ponder that I ask a lot, which is why do we make things? You know, this is the question of commerce. This is the question of industry and job displacement. 
So it's just, why are we doing any of the things that we do? Why, why do we sit down and write a short story? Why do we learn how to sing a song? You know, why do we uh, learn how to cook a better soup? And the answer in some cases is so that we can make some extra money because that's our job. But a lot of the times it's because we are trying to say something that's of importance. We're trying to make a connection with another human. We're trying to change our society and change our laws. And I think that is really worth considering here. Um, in terms of, um, <laughs> we have to ask ourselves why we would even care if AI writes a whole book. And why are we worried that Hollywood can replace all of its movies with AI generated movies? And it seems like an odd question because I think we take it for granted that it's like, well, of course Hollywood can just use AI to make all their movies. And it, it just, to me, asks the question of why do we want to watch those movies? Um, and maybe already in the audience, you're like, I don't want to watch those movies. And that's great. <laughs> you know, vote your, you know, use your vote of consumerism. But I think that's the question is that we have created entire industries that are based around creating sensory stimulus, creating entertainment at the lowest costs to serve the most number of people. That is the only reason AI threatens that entire house of cards, as in we have built this house of cards on the <laughs> detaching the creators of content from the actual content. And because of that, because we've severed that connection, that's the only reason AI can replace the kind of art and content that we're consuming. And so I think, and this is how I personally feel, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you can choose to read you know, people that you know or that you care about or saying something of value in your life. And that's something I think you can apply generally. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Two months ago, I was playing a lawyer. I was talking to Miami. We had a ton of grief. The subject was um, dealing with uh, when. Oh, oh, I see. I'm being recorded, apparently. Okay. <laughs> you didn't even know it. <laughs> ah, that's okay. Uh, you don't want my name also done. No. Um, so the, the, the subject had to do with uh, search and seizure in a criminal case and in somebody's yard and so on. And, so on. and I did a lot of those cases in my, in, in my career. Um, and so he got a hold of this service and it's got AI for research, legal cases. And he presented a factual scenario and asked the question about, is it legal search or not? And um, came out with like seven or eight different supposed cases. Only three of them had citations with the name of a case, book and page number, the other four didn't. Language was pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute. So <laughs> those, are the, those are the ones that don't have a citation you could not use. And I thought, who came up with those, you know? And so who verifies what? It's like when you post something on Facebook or something, you know, it's, you know, fake news or something. Who's verifying all this stuff and who's putting it out there? And the other thing is I'm thinking, okay, I wanna know what, which religion should be the, the religion, religion that I choose. And every fundamentalist of any religion will say, well, you gotta choose mine, you know? Uh, or an atheist, or or what have you, and you can you can have a child and ask that question in their computer, and what's AI going to answer, and who's going to be like you know Bob's question? Who the who are the gatekeepers? Or and those are the things that scare me. Mm -hmm. So what do you what do you say about those things? Yeah, no, you know it, it's interesting because it comes back to that kind of trust but verify conversation that was over here, and it, it, it's funny because I would say don't trust it. <laughs> You know, period. And I, I think that that doesn't undermine its use as a learning tool, which is kind of the, the double take here is I think we are hoping that this is just something that will do things for us and we'll just spit out answers and, you know, just give us things without citations. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, imagine a doctor, you know, that was like, you need to have surgery and you asked it why. And it just said, you just do. <laughs> and you said, no, but really, why do I need to have the surgery? And it just said that that's just the answer. You need to have surgery. Even if he's right or she is right, you know, like it's it's not that's not what it means to practice, you know, medicine. 
you know, it means having explanation, it means having sources, you know, it means having the entire, you know, body of medicine behind you and the methodology of it. And um, uh, um, so, you know, when it comes to that kind of like citation engine, citation machine, you know, on the, on, on the other end, like there's lots of really interesting use cases where, uh, so we've been kind of, I'm kind of talking about this actually just of like a chat GPT would just show up off the shelf, you know, kind of application. Um, but a lot of companies that you're gonna come across and products you're gonna interact with um, do what is called fine tuning model. So basically take that entire big chat GPT and you then add one extra little round of training on a specific subset of information. So an example uh, that I think is a really interesting example is, um, so in law, um, my dad's a criminal defense attorney, he's sitting right there, uh, or what, you know, he's retiring. Um, but my, my girlfriend also works um, public defender service for a very long time. And one of the things she would do is uh, discovery <laughs> and have to rifle through just unbelievable amounts of documents and phone calls and, you know, all these kind of things to, uh, you know, in response to sudden, you know, um, claims or statements by the prosecution. And uh, she's already been, you know, started to get sold on various products that do this, that essentially allow you in a private way that isn't, you know, sending it off to the cloud elsewhere, allows them to take all of those PDFs and documents and phone calls, put it in a little database and uh, ask human questions about it. Did my client say this anytime? You know, was it raining on when, you know, whatever, you know, and so then they can just very quickly on the spot, right before trial in the last second, ask this question. Why do I say all this? It's because that is where you give it the facts. You say, these are facts I trust. And it simply does that kind of summary and analysis at a breakneck speed where right now that's just not happening. It's not that it's not a job that goes away. It's just literally not happening. And the only one that harms is the dependent <laughs> who needs those facts made clear and plain you know, for, for the law. So anyway, this, it's not a clear cut case, but it is an interesting example of where facts matter a lot. It seems like, people are tending to turn toward not just trusting its general knowledge, but feeding it the facts that they want it to uh, help analyze and find patterns in um, quicker. Uh, well, let's go back there and we'll go to you, Bob. Thank you. I've been an educator in the health sciences for about 30 years and researcher. And so I was grading papers when they were written, <laughs> handwritten, and then it became electronic. And I noticed that once you had papers in Word and that you could track changes, mm -hmm. that the ability to teach students to write well really diminished because they would just accept the changes without reading it and, and it becoming ingrained in them. And then plagiarism has always been a problem and we got software that we could track and then tell whether sentences and how many words were plagiarized and the other thing as an educator I've seen is cheating mm -hmm. and so I deal with a lot of pre-med pre-dent students and the cheating over the past I'd say 10 years has become really rampant and faculty have had to change dramatically to keep up with that and we are now getting papers that we are fairly certain are written completely by AI. And, you know, when you talk about the cathedral and building it together, it bothers me that I know that we've got doctors and dentists that are cheating and having AI writing their papers. And at this point, we can't even prove that that's happening. But we know based on student skills and past interaction with them that these probably are not their papers. And so that's something as an educator, I really struggle with that is the dark side of AI. And, and I think we're putting people, our students, I mean, again, over the years, just their writing skills. And then just to add one more thing, I read a guy, he, he wrote that he, he gave this um, a presentation at a funeral. And so many people came up to him and he said about half the people asked him if that AI had helped him write and, and compose what he said at the, the funeral. And so people are starting to assume that if you do something 
creative that's really good that it's not just your work and that bothers me too yeah. and so I don't know if anybody else that has that's a problem but your comment on that I would, especially by the challenge of educators and trying to detect AI mm. yeah no I, I think yeah lots of really good points in there uh, the last one I find to be pretty funny just layers to that one <laughs> You know, people are like, it, it makes really bad stuff, but then they're like, wow, you did something amazing. You must have used GPT. <laughs> it's like, how do you reconcile these things? But um, uh, let's see. Well, you know, I, so the, the, the cheating and plagiarism question is one that definitely is in our wheelhouse, you know, that we've, we've interacted with. And I, I think, first of all, I, I definitely feel, you know, we work with, or feel for educators and, and teachers and professors and uh, you know, I have good friends who do all of that, as well as, again, we work on the ground doing research with this. And it is just tough to throw a curveball like that right as a lesson, you know, or right as a semester starting and be like, here's this tool that allows you to make all your essays instant. <laughs> and, you know, there's there's no time or money or resources to, you know, adapt or change, you know, lesson plans or change how you test and, and so forth. So I think particularly right when it was released and it continues to be a pain. Uh, yeah, that, that was just a big kind of sock in the gut, I think, for a lot of people. And so I think, yeah, that, that's really interesting and, and unfortunate. Um, you know, I think the, a big question, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I think this one's just unsolved right now, is labeling things as AI, you know, like that, that's kind of a little bit at the root of it is, can you generate something with AI and pass it off as if it isn't, you know, like that's kind of at the root, you know, like, Plagiarism is a specific thing within academia, but I think that's kind of the general conversation everywhere, which is, can you just print ideas and pass them off as your own? <laughs> and I think that definitely puts stress on a lot of our ways of measuring, you know, measuring success in school in terms of like having these point in time measurements. Um, you know, I think that's why it's an issue. You know, the fact that you can pay someone to write a book for you as a ghostwriter and then write it off as your own name is also a sign you know, that we do this all the time is that we have funny ways of signing, like, did you make this thing? And it gets murkier when it's AI facilitated, you know, where it's not even just, I wrote this thing. It's kind of doing even what I'm saying, which is like collaborating with it, putting it in there, you know, having it give you feedback on it. Is that, you know, is that problematic? Does that need to be announced? I mean, most literary and fiction magazines right now are carte blanche ban on AI generated content uh, and, you know, want labels on things that have been assisted by it. And again, I think that's a good thing to help people decide. I don't think it's a replacement for integrity. I don't think it's a replacement for all of the other reasons people have cheated for all of history that we need to be vigilant in cultivating. Yeah, as well. yeah. So I have to play the role of gatekeeper, actually, <laughs> and inform you that we have about five minutes uh, before we reach the four o'clock hour. So if there's any additional questions or closing thoughts on your part. So you mentioned Sam Altman uh, quite a bit in your talk. And for those of you that don't know, Sam Altman is one of the past executives of Y Combinator. And he's seen thousands upon thousands of amazing startups and amazing ideas. Why do you think Sam Altman picked OpenAI? That's a good question. It's, it's a funny question because um, you know, the way Sam Altman uh, talks about how, you know, going back to the historical question, is, you know, they put, as first as a nonprofit, they put millions of dollars training this thing over many, many you know, months and years, and they didn't know if it was going to work. <laughs> so they were like, we didn't know if this is going to be a, you know, brilliant super intelligence or just a really expensive paperweight. And um, yeah, it's a good question. Why, why did he choose to do this? You know, why did he think? I mean, I think it goes back to that. I think it has unbelievable commercial workability. I mean, I think more than the computer did. You know, I think the computer took decades to see productivity gains from it. <laughs> you know, the computer was a confusing instrument that changed workflows and made people less efficient. They had to learn things and you know, change how they do everything. And it wasn't adopted like wildfire overnight. You know, 100 million people didn't use the computer the first day the computer came out. <laughs> so I think, I mean, to your point, Sam Altman, somebody who's deeply embedded in startup communities and entrepreneurism and knows market fit, I think 
he clearly sees that creating something for zero dollars, you know, creating something for nothing is the most productive instrument in commerce in all of history. <laughs> Again, even if the quality is lower, like that's that's not how to me commerce works. Commerce is not maximum quality, you know, it's good enough at the right price point. <laughs> so it's kind of an instrument for that, which is kind of the mixed sword. I mean, in terms of closing thoughts here, um, you know, and and one of my opening questions was, can you learn with AI? And then should you? <laughs> And you know, with Bill Gates saying, you know, we can teach every kid on the planet how to read faster with less resources. In some ways, that's a good thing. But is it a good thing if you know kids are in a terminal around the world just learning how to read? <laughs> they could just be reading a book, you know. Uh, it's a it's a mixed sword. It's a mixed bag, you know. So I would encourage you. I think my really my takeaway is I would encourage you to play with it. Just try it yourself. I think if anything, AI aside, that's the best way to learn anything. You know, I can sit up here and talk, and we can talk about it. But try it. Use it in your daily life if you're interested in it, particularly if you're skeptical, seeing if you can learn something with it, if it has something to offer, and put it aside if it doesn't. I think you know that will make you a more engaged and informed person when it comes to policy conversations. It will make you more informed when it comes to choosing whether or not you'd like to read AI-facilitated or AI-generated content. Um, and I think, yeah, you really ultimately have to come to those decisions yourself on if you would you know, cover by cover, book next to book, choose, you know, AI generated book or AI facilitated book for 50 cents or pay $20 and buy the Montana author. <laughs> so that's my closing thoughts. Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, I'll be around. Thank you. Thank you.